a nice introduction. I will come to my talk about clouds in the cloud. An efficient cloud-based rendering of real-time volumetric clouds. So there's a little bit of password bingo, and there will be a lot of more clouds in the slides. Um, this work was a joint effort by Cart University of Technology and also Huawei Technologies in Austria. So um, why do we care about clouds? Um, probably all of you know this beloved wallpaper um, back from the good times. Um, and the clouds are here very important. Just imagine if you would exchange the cloudscape here, it's partly clouded um, clouds with a clear cloudscape or a thunderstorm, this would completely change the atmosphere of the picture, pun intended. So, um, so from this, it's natural that we have a lot of ongoing research in this topic. Um, this dates back probably around 40 years or something, so older than I am. Um, the, the, the simplest approach are probably skyboxes, where you have just pre-rendered images. Probably all are familiar with those, come in different flavors, like cube map texture or spherical mapped images. Then we have more dynamic approaches with like billboards and imposters, lookup tables, meta balls. Recently, there was a surge, especially in AAA production, real-time games, ray marching based approaches, and also recently there are some neural networks which still not um, um, work in real-time. Probably as a AI evolves, it will probably become real-time possible in the near future. In our work, and also in this talk, I mostly care, uh, oh, we mostly care about ray march based approaches, um, just a really quick overview because it's not that important for the talk and also for the paper because in theory our caches work with other techniques as well. But in ray marching, you just, um, for all screen pixels which are not occluded, you just ray march from a lower bound where your clouds can form towards your exit where the clouds stop to be appearing. And in your ray marching steps, you just um, calculate density. This is usually done by looking up a weather map where the artist has control where clouds can form and their properties. Um, as well as some 3D noise textures, usually a combination between Perlin and Brolin noise, to give the clouds its shape and their random details and fine and coarse details. If you're interested in the more details, I highly recommend, if the slide changes, the talks by Andrew Schneider from Gorilla. Um, they were part of the um, advances in real time rendering for games at SIGGRAPH 2017 and 2022, I think. So there he goes into much more detail how the system can be implemented. So um, now that we know why we um, use clouds, uh, why we need clouds, and also if you think about, so I haven't discussed this here, um, during the sampling you also need to ray march towards the sun to get like in-scattering effects. So you have a lot of work to be done here because those multiply with your first step sizes. So ray march based approaches are quite expensive. So I just recall one number, on old generation hardware, so PS4, even at quarter resolution, it still took about two milliseconds for the Horizon game from the talk by Andrew Schneider. So this is quite computationally um, expensive, even on today's hardware. So what we can we do? We can move it to the cloud. And the first thing will probably be, yeah, we have the more powerful hardware. But actually, we aim at sharing computations between viewers, so get down the overall cost in computations. And for this, just imagine a really simple VR application, for example, like I think there is something like this, like a fighting game in a Colosseum, where players just randomly, or totally randomly, run through the scene. And then you just visualize on the right, if you would have a skybox, how often is a pixel of the skybox actually used. And there you can see here in purple that for many viewpoints, a large portion of the screen can be reused, so we can share their computations. So there is a high potential for saving on hardware budget or energy um, or both. Now comes the question, cloud computations, when you go beyond a simple skybox, are few dependent. How can we actually share those computations between different viewpoints? And for this, we need to cache them somehow. And we had some simple requirements. The first one was to have a really easy integration path into existing rendering techniques and pipelines and game engines. We want to have the same visual quality, a really low overhead, and support for different cloud rendering techniques. And for this, I was a paper before in Pascal's talk, we use our work, effect-based multi-view caching and for cloud native rendering, and also I and Wolfgang will present this work at SIGGRAPH in around five weeks, I think. So we use the area on surface caches to store the clouds on. A really quick overview, they are object-based caches, object caches, where you simply have um, multiple resolutions, 
They're completely um, software virtualized, so you only require memory where you store information on, and they support resolutions from one by one up to 64 by 64K, so you can really get close to your clouds and far away to your, uh, from your clouds, and you, the system covers you all. However, now comes the elephant in the room, where do we put on-surface caches on for clouds? Because usually clouds don't have geometry. Especially for the ray marching approaches, you don't have any geometry at all. And what we can do here is the most simple approach is just place a sphere around the scene. Simply, um, very um, similar to Skybox. What you do is, in the first step, um, you determine which texels of your sphere are visible by the viewer. This is handled by on-surface caches. Then you have a separate update stage where you have all the texels which are required in a work queue. From this work queue, you compute back your origin. In this case, you can just use the center of the sphere or the camera if you have a simple uh, one single camera, and then do your ray marching into the clouds and store density and color information, which is usually enough to reproduce the final shading. However, now when we add multiple viewers, we have there one problem. Um, if we use the computations from before, here shown in green, and you move the camera in the sphere, you will actually have a misalignment between your view rays in red, the second camera, and your cache update location, because cloud computations are view dependent overall. Now comes the question, does this, is this an issue? And when you render it, it quite looks quite awful, especially if you move far away from the center, then you can see, I hope it's visible, uh, distortions of the clouds. You can see that those are not really 3D anymore. Um, so yeah, we will see later how far we can push the system in this direction. However, there's a bigger issue with, hopefully if the video works, probably a bit not of good quality, but still the clouds look like billboards, if you, if you use this simple setup. So this is not really working great. Um, okay. So what we can do here to improve and add this parallax, which is pr uh, present in nature because clouds are at different distances to the viewer, they move at different speeds when you move through the scene, and to reproduce this, we can add multiple spheres. And here's a simple example with two spheres. They, ha they cover just some intervals in your atmosphere, and um, different clouds are stored on different spheres depending on their distance to the viewer, or the center of the sphere, in this example. There's just one small issue. If you have a cloud spanning over multiple spheres, you have to be careful to store it on a single sphere, because otherwise you will have a problem that when you move, the cloud will slice into two, and you can see the inside of the cloud, which usually has not a great shading information there. So what we can do is just extend the ray marching um, outside of the cloud and then switch to the next layer. And, and then we have the cloud on a single layer, which then solves this issue. However, there's still one small problem with this approach is when the because your pla planet is obviously, or most of the time, larger than, than your scene. So the bounding box of your scene, where you scale your spheres off, are too small to, to cover the whole planet. And then clouds which are far away are still on a single sphere. So you have the same problem when you look close to the horizon. And to fix this, we can just scale everything up. So now we take the planet scale into account. So our caching spheres here in blue and orange um, now have a constant altitude around the planet. Obviously now you have a really big sphere. Um, so we have in the paper a small section about how we create this, because usually if you know how high you can go in your, in your scene, you know how much of the sphere you actually need, because the other thing is blocked by the surface of the planet. And also we can get away with some adaptive resolutions, because close to the horizon, usually due to atmospheric scattering, you cannot see small issues there. So you only need a good resolution at the zenith of, of above your update point. And also, uh, speaking about the update point, we also you, um, move it from the center of the sphere to the surface of your planet, because otherwise you would have distortions even the center of your scene. So, um, and this then fixes the issue, because the clouds usually follow the surface of the planet in terms of, of altitude, our caching spheres as well, so you can then um, don't have problems there. And this also now has like a parallax effect, so you can here, for example, see the things with our method, so the update position is fixed, so this is wrong. So the clouds look different because they move a bit different still. However, it looks much better than the single sphere approach from before. Um, okay. And before I talk about um, the server structure, quickly note here, we also do cloud shadows. 
They are a bit of a free lunch, so there's not a small section in, in the paper, also in the presentation, because on-surface caches work on the surface already. Um, they are few independent, because they only are like a dampening factor of incoming light. So we can just um, simply add to the on-surface cache as a simple compute shader, remarching towards the sun, accumulating the density values, store them in the caches during the rendering, just dampening the incoming light based on the, the, the density of the remarch. This is really simple and yeah, nothing really new here. But this allows us to share it between multiple viewers. Now comes the question, how can we distribute the viewers to GPUs? And for this, because I said already before, um, when you move far away from the center, you get distortions and get a generally uh, um, worse visual quality. So what we propose are like few cells. Few cells group, group many viewers. They have the same set of caches, so they need to be in a, in a general vicinity. Um, for example, if you have a game, you probably know some hotspots where, where people will gather, like town halls, auction halls, some global events or anything. And there you can just play static few cells with a fixed size. And also if you have, for example, a cooperative shooter game, like a famous zombie shooter, you know probably that the users move as a bulk of few your scene. And you can also have like a dynamic few cells which moves through the scene. And in the paper we also have a user study about um, how much the uh, your movement can differ from the movement of the average few cell. So you still don't notice the, the wrong renderings, which is not covered in this talk, but there's a bit about this in the paper. And for actual server configuration, so what we do is we split um, few cells to GPU nodes. Um, we only had a GPU node with eight GPUs, Tesla 8, I think 1000 or 9000, not sure. The one which is similar in performance to 3090. Um, and we um, split them into output GPUs. So what they are doing is they render the, visi the visibility buffer. So this is required for down-surface caches. Really simple, just render your unique triangle ID of the scene. This is then sent to the effect GPUs. I will cover them later. Um, after this, or while the transfer is happening, the GPU can render everything not cache related, so the whole scene without clouds and cloud shadows, then waits for the data from the effect GPUs. And what they get are all the vBuffers, does the, the deduplication on surface, cache rela uh, on surface cache related, then does the cache updates, which is the ray marching I talked before, and then renders the images with only the clouds or the cloud shadows. And this is then sent back to the output GPUs to the correct one, which then combines both images, does some post-processing like tone mapper, mapping, and then there's also the encoding in a video stream. And from this then, we don't really cover in the paper anymore because from there on we don't have any novelty there. We just send the data to the client, which renders the image and sends the input, so there is nothing new there. So um, how does the system actually fare in terms of visual quality and scaling? For visual quality, the left one you can see like a reference implementation. Um, looks a bit bloggy on the, on the Beamer. Sorry for that. Um, on the right side, you can see our cached rendering. So this is without compression. This is just comparing the system, um, your potential visual quality when you don't factor compression into account. Um, you can see not really differences. Also, when we visualize the, the flip error metrics, so this is not the Beamer. The image is actually close to, to black at every pixel because there are only some tiny errors because the um, object space caches do not always align perfectly with your screen space pixels. So you have there a sub-pixel misalignment, so the remarch interaction will be slightly different. However, you will not really notice a visual difference by this. Um, and actually, on-service caches can also lower the resolution in the form of a mid bias. And there you can see as you increase your mid bias, you will see that the errors actually will increase because the caches just cannot represent the high frequency of the information of the clouds. And for this, we also did a user study where we had 16 participants. They were watching uh, movie clips for a reference, different mid biases. And, um, and from this, I'm um, just a short explanation is you can see that up to mid bias of two, you probably um, will not have a problem with your viewers. However, when you go beyond this, there will be a sharp decrease in visual quality. Um, obviously, this depends a bit on your scene. So if you have um, more details in your clouds, you'll probably uh, will shift the scale towards mid bias of one. So this is just a baseline when you're implementing such a system. Um, the next question is how far can we actually move away from the center? So in this VR example from before, 
there were like nine meters because the center was the middle of the arena. There you cannot really tell a difference. Um, and we scale it up to 90 meters. Now the clouds look different, especially if you look at the holes in the carousel. So you can see that the cloud move differently um, to be expected because we still cache them on a specific distance to the viewer, but in the real um, the reference implementations, they have varying distances in the range where the sphere is placed. And if we scale it up to 3200 uh, meters, then you can again see the large distortions towards the center, and then the user will probably tell you this does not look great. And this is um, also what our user study suggests. So what you can see here is when you move upwards, you can get away only with probably around 1,000 meters. Um, and in the horizontal plane, basically double that amount. It's to be expected when you move upwards, you reduce the distance to the clouds much more quickly than moving in the horizontal plane. So we'll see the errors much more quickly. And now to the um, runtime. So what we did is um, we rendered the, the, the clouds without a scene. So there's like the, the worst case in terms of memory consumption and in runtime. Um, and have like a fixed overlamp experiment where they move um, on a random camera path just to simulate some movement. So you get like um, memory allocations from the surface caches to make this um, fa a fair comparison. And what you can see here is um, with no overlap. So the overlap is controlled by putting them on the same position but rotating them around the up axis. So then you can control just the overlap of your, of your field of view, which nearly directly correlates to the um, overlap in the surface caches, so the shared computations. And here you can see with no overlap, this is the light blue um, line here, we are slightly above the reference implementation, which just um, scales linearly with the number of viewers because we don't share any computations there due to um, cache overhead. And as you increase the overlap, um, you will see that our runtimes um, linearly decrease, as you would expect. And when you add a mid pass to it, you basically just half the, the amount of time we take to compute our shaders, um, our caches, and from of two, this, this um, scales nicely, as you would expect. There is some constant overhead to it, as I said, due to cache management and, and cache allocation. And in terms of memory, so you can see the memory for 16 viewers, so in a worst case scenario with um, unbiased caches, we use with the additional buffers like 1.3 gigabytes, which is usually not a problem, even on consumer GPUs, as long as those are not modern 1080p cards, then one gigabyte shouldn't be um, a problem. And as you increase the mid bias, the memory again will half basically and will linearly decrease with the number of the overlap percent that you achieve in your um, application. And with this, I want to conclude my talk. So what we show in our work is how to efficiently share view-dependent data in a view-independent uh, manner. We show that it scales um, with the overlap um, and has the same visual quality when you don't apply a mid bias. And even with some form of mid bias, you can still um, use, uh, still achieve quite similar perceived quality. And also in the paper, we have like system-based baselines if you want to implement as a system, which can be a good guideline when starting implementing this. And with this, thank you for your attention and looking forward for your questions. Thank you, Alexander. Any questions? There's one question here on the front row. Thank you, very nice talk. Um, so I'm curious what your motivation is to use ray marching. Um, because I have a hunch if you would instead use um, free flight distances, um, that would in certain cases make things easier. For example, you said uh, there is no surface hit. Um, well, the free flight distances would give you one. I'm not um, familiar yeah. with free flight surfaces, but in theory you can just exchange the map. So it's not really important that we use the ray marching because what you get in your update shader is your surface location, where the cache is placed, your center, and that's everything you have. So all methods which, which can calculate the pixel value with those two um, information, piece of information can be used in our um, system. So it's not really very much specific at all. But your uh, depth, so to say, is flat, right? Like it's on the sphere that, surface. The depth of the sphere or? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 it's closely to flat if you are on the ground level because the atmosphere is mostly flat, if you mean this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, anyone else? 
We have time for one more question. Okay, I will ask you, uh, uh, what kind of sampling along the array for the tray marching you use? Is this like regular sampling or? Um, no, so. Um, is this some woodcock sampling or which one? <laughs> um, for the ray marching, um, this is basically just an adaptive step size, if you mean this. So when you are inside a cloud, you lower your step size, also go a bit backwards, so you find the, the beginning of your cloud. This is the same as um, what was uh, described by the talks of Andrew Schneider. So you go back half, half the way, see if you're still inside the cloud, go again back halfwards. When you found the start of your cloud, you have one-tenth of your step size approximately. When you're outside, you can increase your step size, and that's the sampling you do in the remarching. Yeah, but I mean you can use more efficient sampling methods. Uh, probably you can, <laughs> yeah. But then, of course, your screen space will be faster, so this should stay closely the same. Because what we do, um, the overlap basically defines, so we do the same thing. So the, the good thing with on surface caches is that you can just share your update shader. So between the screen space implementation and the cached implementation, there are like three lines of code different. It's just how, how you get the information about the position and the direction. Mm -hmm. So you can just um, plug and play with, with what, whatever you want in there. Should give you the nice scaling because the cache overhead, it's quite low. So you can see it from, 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 from this one. Um, even if you have 16 fewer, so you can see it, it went up from um, 60 to probably 64, and this is still quite low. And for clouds, you can even optimize a bit more, so like half this number. Okay, thank you. Okay, all good. Then thank you, Alexander, once yeah. more.